Honestly, it could be from doing these um, reacts right before our show. It kind of warms us up. up. Yep. Lights so us, makes you, reminds us that we love <sighs> motorsports and that, so, actually, how much we love it. that's a really good point. Let's, okay, yep. I'm getting jazzed up. Let's go. <laughs> Let's get this done because I also want to do this in under an hour. <laughs> okay. So. Well, let's just roll. I don't, hey, are we recording? Welcome to Buddy, yeah, welcome to Buddy Lab <laughs> Podcast. I'm Parker Klegerman, joined as always by Landon Castle. This is our podcast about all motorsports that we hopefully can discuss everything in the motorsports world in under one hour, apparently, on today's show. Uh, what can you expect <laughs> in today's show is tons of Rolex 24 reaction, a review of the new NASCAR Netflix show, driver contracts in F1, and a possible shock driver news down in Australia Plus, much, much more. Hold on. But we start, as always, with the PR lap. What? Do, wait, do, did we need to have watched the Netflix show to do a review, or do you got that handled? No, I have that handled because I haven't watched it either, but we do have someone on this podcast who okay, has watched okay, it. Okay. And he watched okay, all five go. episodes initially after it came out. So let's start the PR lap where we talk about ourselves. Before we do that, remember our pact. This show, if you love it, can you please share it with three friends? Because you know what? That helps us grow. Like we've been doing this first month. This will, when this goes out uh, either tonight or tomorrow on Tuesday, January 30th or January 31st, Wednesday, this will be our biggest month ever in Money Lapse history of downloads. And that is because of all of you who have listened to the pact and spread the word and on YouTube, of course, have subscribed, have liked and commented on those videos. Those are doing better than ever as well. We've basically doubled everything on there. So we appreciate your support. Um... And as you know, this is where we get to definitely talk more about ourselves. I want to start with all of you listeners who down at the Rolex 24 stopped me repeatedly to tell, you, tell me how much you loved the money lap. That meant the world. Thank you so much, Landon. I was blown away by how many people awesome. came up to me. Um, and when you think about it, so many of them were choosing to come up to me instead of Brad Pitt. <laughs> who was also down there at the same time. I will say, he did look at me one time on pit road. I can tell that story another time. But basically, I'm standing on pit road. They're filming. This, that, I want to go into that. We won't do it on this podcast. Maybe another one. But watching that movie be filmed down at the Rolex 24 as it's all going on was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Uh, the level of their production and the fact that I'd be walking to go to my, do my stint on pit road through the, under the Rolex bridge there at Daytona out of the Xfinity garage. And Brad Pitt is walking directly at me to see, like, just randomly in a crowd. And I'm like, what's going on? And then I'm staying on pit road one time, and I'm, ne- I'm like five feet from the pit wall, and I look to the right of me. There's no one else on the pit wall, and it's just Brad Pitt staring at me. <laughs> I was like, what's <laughs> happening? What, what so was, was the cool. team they used for his car and stuff? Did, so, was it familiar to sport in yeah. IMSA, like industry people we know? Yeah, so Wright Motorsports, which has run Porsche for a while, they were the ones who took it on. It was called Chip Heart Racing, and they basically made the race car the same number and look as what's going to be in the movie. Brad Pitt, Patrick Long, uh, and someone else were you know, sort of the movie thing. And then oh. the normal driver set for the race car were all part of the race car. And the pit, they had them pitted, you know, quote-unquote pitted next to each other. The movie pit was just a recreation of the other pit. They never had a car during the race there, but they filmed a lot of shots. And it was in the middle of the race. I mean, cars are going by, you know, pit stops are happening, and Brad is literally going in and out of this tent filming some scene um, with no, like, he had Secret Service level security. But then at times <laughs> when they're filming this scene, there's no security. I mean, he's just literally walking around. I was like, this is wild. It was the coolest thing I've ever seen. So uh, I thought that was awesome. Last bit on that, the whole Rolex 24, I just, for those that weren't there, it was the largest crowd in uh, Rolex 24 history, which beats last year's record crowd. You could mm-hmm. feel it. You could sense it. The weather was awesome. But I have to say that sports car racing right now is in a, a for 100% golden era. And from the manufacturer support, which is just unprecedented, and usually you know, sports car racing lives and dies by manufacturer support, which is always in cycles, somehow all these manufacturers have ended up in the same place at the same time, which is just unheard of. Add in the mm-hmm. fan support, the racing is incredible, and then the talent amongst the drivers in terms of the GTP or the top factory GT cars is just insane. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's all IndyCar, F1, NASCAR, Cup Series, top level talent that just happen to be in sports cars. Um, I- so that's incredible, and it's just 
it's the atmosphere, the vibe around it. We will look back at this in years to come and think that was the coolest damn time for endurance sports car racing in America. I, I share that. I'm and with you know to refrain from trying to just repeat what you just said and maybe hopefully add something to it. You're the sports car expert here, but I am a fan and I do love this racing. And I will say a compliment to sports car racing where it's at right now that it seems like it has progressed from that kind of 2000s era of sports car racing was like a play thing for NASCAR drivers to go to the Rolex Mm -hmm. um, and get an easy win. Right. And the, you know, there was just sporadic manufacturer involvement. They went through this era where the classes I feel like didn't have really good identity, right? They had several Mm -hmm. different LMP classes that just didn't have great identity. Um, and it just seems like they've done a really good job of honing in on the, the four classes, right? The LMP two cars are amazing, like great cars, even balance, not dealing with, you know, um, too much uh what am i trying to uh, bop uh, bop um you've got gtd and gt pro which is you know okay similar cars great differentiation between um driver talent so you still have the accessibility um there to be able to get into the rolex and race with the gtd class um and then obviously you know the prototypes or um Shit, why am I drawing a blank? I just watched the race this weekend. What do you call them now? GTP LB, class. Yeah, hypercar, uh, whatever, yeah. GTP. Right. Um, it is, like you said, in this golden era of true talent, right? It's not just a novelty. You don't just have novelty fill-in drivers in this class. Um, it is truly the greatest world-class sports car drivers in the world um, racing with the best manufacturer support coming down to literally a race for the win, <laughs> at the line in the last 10 laps of this race so it, it is we'll talk it is amazing. yeah <laughs> we'll talk about the finish uh a little later in this episode but to your point just on the talent side you know for years what you were talking about that early 2000s era sports car mm-hmm. racing in america but it kind of extended out to Le Mans and that sort of thing at the time elms was that you had alms you had grand dam there was a split almost like the open wheel, open wheel world um, it was very confusing. You know, manufacturers were involved in some, but not all. They didn't run the same car classes, and it's all just globally come together. Where GT3 has become the GT cat- like classification, and that is the spec design of all the cars. Like not spec design, but that is the the regulations that they all run to around the world. Now um, you have GTP slash hypercar, which is essentially the same rule set. And LMP2. And so it's just allowed the world to come together in sports car racing, and, and they're getting the fruits of those, of those efforts. And then to the talent side, for years, sports car racing was, well, if I don't make it in IndyCar or F1, I'll go sports car racing, right? Mm-hmm. And now you have numerous drivers across the GT and the, the prototype categories that have chosen at 18 years old did forego going towards IndyCar, forego going towards Formula One, Make a and career. go straight for sports cars. Well, it's because they can. They're getting paid well. Yep. The manufacturers are putting money into it. And a lot of that is a product of centralizing these classes internationally, just like you said, right? Yep. Where previously it was, I don't know if it was tail wagging the dog or whatever, but it was like every time a manufacturer came out with a new car or something, that's like they branched off and created another class for it. To say, okay, well, we gotta, you know, we gotta create another class for this style of car or this category, and I think what you know they just did a great job of reining that back in and and giving the manufacturers something to compete against each other over, instead yep. of having twenty different classes worldwide for sports car racing, and now you have the need for real professional drivers in these cars that are getting paid adult money to travel the world <laughs> and and win trophies, which is what motorsports is all about. And I know we're in the PR lab where we're supposed to be talking about ourselves, but we definitely just diverted into a love fest for sports cars. <laughs> that's but okay. maybe that's maybe ourselves because we, yeah. we love it. And <laughs> I do think sport those top-level factory sports car drivers, especially the prototype guys, are some of the coolest race car drivers in the world because, to your mm-hmm. point, they travel the world. There's not a lot of fanfare around it. They kind of you know show up with their bag and gear and go from a 12-hour race yeah. here to a 24-hour race there. To so, and, it, and the last thing I'll put, on, to put a bow on this, sports car racing, even though it's – Glitz or, you know, it has a glitz to it. It's gritty. It's raw. Like when you run for 24 hours, there's no hiding 
you know, sweat, human emotion, mm -hmm. frustration, you know, the cars get beat up and covered in dirt and soot. And it's just like, damn, this is really cool. So, <laughs> well, uh, I know I said that we needed to do an hour. Uh, yep. So let's get on with it. <laughs> let's move on. So more of the PR lap reviews wise, we're at 139 five star reviews on Apple. No new written ones. Go help us out there on our quest to 200 on Spotify. Ron said, great episode, fun podcast, time to binge listen to 2023. Good luck with that. Like the different perspectives, technical info, and informed words. Question, would I hear about dirty air if F1 cars ran 80s aerodynamics? Yes, although, although those cars were highly ground effect based. If we knew about dirty air like we know now, if we ran those cars and knowing everything we know, yes. So I can answer that for you, Landon. You don't even need to answer. Uh, Jonathan Havey, driving style, nerd out alert. Loved it. Keep it coming. <laughs> oh, our deep dives. That's nice. Todd cool. Gullery, great. Keep them coming. And on YouTube, we had a bunch of comments out there across all our content we're putting out. But uh, congrats, fellas. You did it. Single-handedly saved the sport. Yes, we know. We got free entry for everyone at the Clash. You're welcome. Um, I'm trying to read this one. When a car gets out of shape, are you ever able to kind of let the wheel from your, free from your grip and allow the car to straighten itself out? I know it's a strange question, but I've debated with coworkers about this. Great podcast. Do you ever let the wheel just go? I, I've done that before. Yeah. I've let it just sort of go, uh, and then you drive it back. Not to save the car, um, mm -hmm. but I will tell you one thing that I do. Uh, now, I will to, to kind of answer that question, though, I will say that I think that saving a car in a spin is a more of a natural reaction than a how-to. Yep. Um, I think that your hands just naturally try to keep the front wheels straight, and then you're driving it with the pedals um, to save a car, but I do release the steering wheel a lot to recenter myself with a car just on handling wise, not, not in a saving a spin or anything, but, um, I do it down going down the straightaway a lot, um, just to make sure I'm not fighting the front tires to find the trueness of the front tires at intermediate tracks down the straightaway. I'll lighten the grip, let the car track itself and then kind of bring it back into control. And it helps me sort of make sure that I'm not just fighting, um, the, the front tires going into the corner. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know if you do the same thing or not, but I do it. I don't it's really. like a habit for me. I just I'm constantly letting go of the wheel, see how the car wants to track, and then re resetting. I guess the only you know not to totally derail this, but the only way I could, I can see that. I guess I do it more subconsciously. Is like when I go to a trial and I try to get to a place like in a rhythm where I let like when I get to the start finish line, the car naturally gets that perfect angle to the wall mm -hmm. to turn in, especially if I run the bottom. And that's where I like I know I'm in the rhythm if I don't have to do anything, and the car just that's gets there. Similar thing, similar thing. Because yeah. to, to the the last point I'll make on that is like my goal, my if I had to summarize my fundamental driving style is to make the car go through the corner in the most natural shape possible without mm -hmm. putting weight on the wheel. Right. So if I could drive through the corner without turning the wheel at all, I would. So the reason I let go of the wheel down the straightaway or through the trioval is to find what the natural arc of the car wants to turn, right? Yeah. And I, I really first started doing that probably 15 years ago when we started shifting the rear end housings and tracking the cars differently is they, you know, they had a, a much more natural, um, I don't want to, I don't know, lead or something like that to how the car wanted to turn through the corner. So I started doing that and it really helped me out. Hmm. It's interesting. Um, there's your answer. Flip a 25 flaps, 25 K Ben 24. I had an idea to fix NASCAR track limits last year, 1960s style. Hay bells, put them on the outside of the corner. That's a terrible idea. Not going to happen. <laughs> uh, if you've ever hit a hay bale, you'll know why those things are dangerous. It's like lawnmower racing. <laughs> yeah. And they catch cars and, and cart. When I've raced carts and hit one of those, it, it basically whips the cart around and grabs it. Awful. Mm -hmm. Uh, Spencer McCormick, two nine nine. Can't wait for Hendrick to announce their new name. Ally Financial, HMS, Exalta, NASCAR team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be I, – I, you know what's funny is like I don't even want to laugh about that too much because you have no idea over the years how close that place has maybe or maybe not been. I don't know. I don't know mm -hmm. anything. I'm just saying no idea how close that place has been to adding a title sponsorship to its name. They would have to change all the, a lot of branding to get that done and um, – who knows? It would uh, it would make for a long title on the box of your diecast, 
And if you are a racing enthusiast looking oh. for a high-quality diecast, look no further than SpoilerDieCast.com, one of the fastest-growing companies in the industry. Who sets them apart? Well, Parker, let me tell you, because they pride themselves on exceptional service. All their orders ship either same or next day, ensuring you get your hands on your favorite products in no time. Here's the best part. They have free shipping on orders over $20. That's right. You can enjoy a smooth and affordable shopping experience with SpoilerDieCast.com. They have over 800 unique products in stock, probably more than that right now leading up into the race season. They have one of the largest inventories in the industry with NASCAR, Dirt, Sprint Cars, F1, IndyCar. Are there sports car diecasts as well? Are there IMSA uh, diecasts? Is I don't it? know, really. They're, they're very few and far between, but if there's anyone that can that make it happen, to it's happen. diecasts. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe even shoot them an email and make a request. See if you can find out if we can source them. Anyways, as passionate racing fans ourselves, we're constantly growing our collections, our offerings. We go to SpoilerDieCast.com for that. So should you. Bam. SpoilerDieCast.com. Check them out. As a reminder, I have a diecast this year. If you want an autographed version, you can get it at SpoilerDieCast.com. Use code MONEYLAP. Um, let's jump into NASCAR stuff and biggest news. Report out there, NASCAR's closest it's ever been to an international Cup Series race. A lot of talk mm. over the last couple of years of uh, a NASCAR Cup race happening in Canada, Montreal more specifically. That was a something that was rumored uh, to be really close uh, at the end of last year. It didn't come together, but I would love to see that. There's talk of Mexico, and of course NASCAR has a Brazilian series now, um, and they're expanding worldwide with their sort of regional series. So... Mm-hmm. The Cup Series could have a points-paying race internationally any moment, and I'd love to see it. And I think one good quote I saw in this, though, this article that was on motorsport.com was a, a, a really insightful uh, thought process behind this in that it's not about just going and doing one international race, right? It's mm-hmm. about saying, hey, where can we go for five years that's going to have a benefit to the Cup Series, to that area, mm-hmm. to that track to nascar expanding globally and so i think that's a really smart way to tackle this uh but uh, i'd love to see it let's talk about it for just a second we don't have to deep dive mm-hmm. this i know i said we were trying to keep this under an hour today <laughs> but like you know i feel like a an international cup race is imminent like it, it's yep. it's been clear where they want to go we've heard so many rumblings i i thought that and i feel like a lot of other people thought that montreal was going to be on the schedule this year right yeah. so um, obviously, the report here that we're reading is as close as it's ever been. I feel like it's imminent. imminent. But let's just say, what, what do you think we need to see of a NASCAR international race? Like, what do you think, what should we be showing international fans? Because part of me is like, wants to show them good, hard, short track stock car racing. Mm. Right? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, Garage 56 was amazing, and seeing that car on at Le Mans was incredible. Um, and, and Montreal is Circuit de Gilles Villeneuve is, is Gilles Villeneuve or whatever, how you say it is, is an amazing track. I've raced at it. I've been to Montreal. It's a beautiful city, but how special would it be to go to Europe or go to Montreal and race in a stadium in a way, in a form of racing that those cultures are not used to seeing, right? How special would that be to do like what we're doing at the LA Coliseum or to, to build a short track. I don't know. Like it may be building a short track is a little bit tougher, but like how, how special would it be to show Europeans or show Canadians or show, you know, down in South America to show them what a, a half mile quarter mile stock car race looks like. God shit. That'd be awesome. (laughs) That's that's the way I, I, you know, my point on this whole, temporary track thing that we've proved can be done at the Coliseum is like, all right, the next step for that is building a 32 degree banking one. Right. And yeah. how can you put one up in, I don't know, somewhere where Manchester United plays in London and be able to put on like what you're talking about, which is like high banked or unique short track stock car racing, something that they, you know, doesn't remind them of the British touring cars or supercars or F1. It's like, Whoa, right. I've never seen this before. Right. I think it would be hard. That'd be amazing. I think it would be hard to build banking uh, How a dare you track in those dreams. stadiums. I know I don't want to ruin I think it'd be hard to build banked tracks in those stadiums, but who knows? Maybe they could build a temporary racetrack somewhere that's a quarter of a mile or three eighths of a mile or half a mile 
and have all of the trappings and everything it needs to be able to put on a three or four or 500 lap race with pit pit areas and, and pit road and still have a stadium yes. where you can seat a hundred thousand people. Um, uh, gosh, I just, if I We've had, saved if I only NASCAR had one, again, literally, <laughs> if I only had I, one honestly. thing that I could show the European mind can't comprehend, <laughs> right? Like if I, if it were yep. just pulling from the meme, the European mind cannot comprehend Martinsville. Like they just can't. <laughs> and I would, I want to yep. show it to them. I want to show them Bristol. I want to show I want them Bristol. Dale Earnhardt and Terry Labonte yeah. at Bristol. <laughs> I want like, <laughs> I want Bristol and yeah, and I want it. I want to show that. I want Winchester, but in, in yeah, in London, and the biggest stars from NASCAR there, and yeah, yeah, that will that Winchester, will but in Chichester, <laughs> yeah, it will explode <laughs> brains that day. Yeah, Winchester and Gloucester, whatever <laughs> Gloucester, <laughs> in Manchester. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh god that'd be awesome ah, all here, right let's talk fast so well just real quickly once again oh i broke my thing again by the way oh no i keep breaking my camera sorry to the youtube viewers and if you're listening you didn't care but let's move <laughs> on the we we talked about it the massive huge unbelievably big moment has occurred for nascar and that is that their netflix full speed Docu series has been released last night. It came out at 3 a.m. Eastern time, 12 on the West Coast. Uh, a lot of people thinking this is going to be do big things for NASCAR. Maybe not similar to Drive Survive, but at mm-hmm. least show people the behind the scenes what it, what it takes to race at the highest level. And the NASCAR Cup Series is the biggest motorsport in America. Um, I haven't been able to watch it. You haven't been able to see it yet, but we have someone on this podcast who has. That is producer Josh. Let's bring him on for a quick review. A di- likes and dislikes, Josh, of what we saw, what you saw watching all five episodes, which means I'm amazed that you're still producing this podcast at the moment because you haven't slept. But what, what did you like and what did you not like? <laughs> well, the, the first thing I liked was the fact that Denny Hamlin has thoroughly established himself as the main character of NASCAR thanks to this docuseries. <laughs> I have... <laughs> Never see it, it might as well be called the Denny Hamlin show and friends uh, because I felt like I was watching Denny Hamlin once again have his year and then mm. he, just like the <laughs> Dallas Cowboys choked it right at the end right as you get into the playoffs Denny Hamlin didn't make it so <laughs> it was great I got a comp I got a I got to compliment him because that whoever the producer was they gave him plenty of time they got to talk about him a lot but it was really it was really fun to see the behind the scenes of that whole entire those those weeks leading up to the playoffs him trying to show where his alliance and allegiance was with JGR and 2311 with two cars trying to make the playoffs it was some behind the scenes action that I as a fan did not get to see and this really they talked about it and it wasn't it didn't hide behind that and it didn't really feel like a lot of those overproduced um you know driver moments it's you know denny's pretty raw and that's what makes the series pretty good and it was enjoyable to see that as well as a lot of the other drivers and have them talk about that and Mm -hmm. and show that and um again thank you ryan priest for taking that hard hit that certainly made several featurettes (laughs) in daytona uh for that that last episode i'm sure you knew it would the netflix executives (laughs) were Mm-hmm. We're like, I'm glad he's, I'm glad he's healthy. We are using that for sure. Do you think he got yeah. hazard pay for that? I hope so. I, I okay. certainly hope so. Um, <laughs> but all right, give me, give me some likes. Give me like three likes. Three likes. Three, three dislikes. dislikes. All right. Three likes. Uh, actually, I'll start with three dislikes. One, um, if you're a NASCAR fan, first episode, it's gonna feel very, uh, I don't know, spoon feedy. But that's mm-hmm. to be expected, just like Drive to Survive. I feel like uh, for a lot of the fans, including myself, when we watched Drive to Survive, the first season felt very, you know, felt good. But going back and watching it as a fan now, it may feel a little spoon feedy. Um, another, uh, you know, it's really hard to come up with dislikes because I actually really enjoyed the series. But I'd say five episodes is not enough. Um, you have 10 right. races. Forcing that into five episodes feels a little rushed. But the pacing's really damn good. So that tells me next season should just be the whole season. 
and do 10 episodes over the course of the whole season. Mm-hmm. And we yep. have five for the playoffs, five for the regular season. Let's do that. Let's give ourselves like a little bit of breathing room so we can enjoy it just like uh, uh, Netflix does. And then the other thing is don't release it at 12 a.m. Um, I really wanted to get some sleep last night, and <laughs> I'm really frustrated. So let's let's release it at a normal time. Uh, and then Wait Mike, a second. This thing came out last night, and you watched the whole series? <laughs> oh, yeah. So he did. I've watched, oh, my God. I was up till 4.30 in the morning today. Um, I watched every episode. <laughs> I um, I'm sleep deprived. If you can't tell. Uh, oh my so gosh! After I'd I had a, be a miracle if this episode makes it out there. <laughs> I'm gonna pass out. <laughs> um, three likes. It was really cool um, to see the behind the scenes and be just. It felt drive to survivey in the right ways. It wasn't over dramatized. I felt like what they were saying actually happened. It didn't feel like they were getting radio clips from other times in the season and inserting it to tell a storyline to make it more interesting it felt real um hmm. I, hmm. I i know with drive to survive they'll take out of context radio clips put it other places to make them tell a story didn't seem like they did that here it was awesome two i really love the fact that they showed the team and why it's a team sport rather than just just on the That's driver cool. and then yep. three i like that it's outside of the racetrack a lot of the time it's not everything's at the track. It's not all this. Because we always see the drivers in that environment. We don't see them outside mm-hmm. of that environment. In team meetings, with their family, how they plan all that. Hmm. So Awesome. I think you, you missed one bit there, Josh. Oh, did I? What did I miss? Yeah. Uh, apparently, two people had cameo appearances in this <laughs> you, Netflix You are absolutely correct. I, I did yeah. forget to mention that. My fourth like is the fact that um, Parker Kligerman does make a cameo, and so does Landon Castle, which Landon, I gotta hand it to you, Let's that's go! really damn impressive that you made a cameo when you weren't <laughs> even at the, tr- the tracks this year, so I'm I'm so proud of you for <laughs> that. I, now I'm gonna have to figure out why how I got in this show, and I would, didn't even go to a race last year, so. <laughs> um. I can spoil it, it's very minor. No, don't spoil it. All right. Don't spoil it. Watch the show and then send us a tweet. Yep. Send me a tweet. Send it, leave a comment. Leave a review. And let me know where I'm at in this show. Somebody yes. <laughs> somebody tweet at me and tell me where I'm at in the show. And it sounds like, uh, please do the same for myself. It also sounds like I may not have been on camera. It was just my voice. Thank you, Josh. So whoever he pointed out. But he Josh That's doesn't remember enough. if I was there or not. So all I can say is your two hosts here on the Money Lab have made it on the Netflix Let's go. We did it. <laughs> We're on the biggest thing there is. Thank you. It's a big day for us. Josh, great review. Appreciate it. That was very insightful. I'm looking forward to watching it. I will probably watch some tonight. Uh, I will not do it all in one sitting like Josh. There's just no chance. Um, speaking of other Joshes in NASCAR, moving on, Josh Williams will be in the number 16 cup car for select races, including the Clash this weekend. He was announced as the driver in Xfinity Series at Colleague. He's now going to be driving partial races in that 16 cup car, which means we now know it's AJ Allmendinger, SVG, and Josh Williams uh, so far splitting races. But I don't know if that uh, we know all the races yet. So things become clear for what's occurring in uh, one of the only cup seats that's not entirely filled. Hey, some something uh, kind of interesting mm-hmm. out there. Do you remember the story yeah. of the guy who like showed up to Talladega and paid for a car and like got this thing all set up and like did the race or something and then ran away afterwards and no one ever saw saw him and his name was L W Wright. Uh, I feel like I heard about this though. So I don't remember all the details perfectly, but we did just see this and and Josh put it in there. Uh, apparently. This, you know, that guy's true identity was never quite figured out, although there was a guy who said he was him. Well, that guy who said he was that guy, uh, well, that, that's confusing. I should probably that one. A lot try, of that probably try that yep. one again. You, you yep. get what I was tra- I'm going with this. Um, he passed away recently. So oh, that's too bad. Uh, that's sad, but also it sounds like if it was him, he was kind of a career con man. Um, <laughs> and, and, it's quite a con know. to sneak your way into a NASCAR yeah. race. Well, I, don't, I don't know that part of NASCAR history. I don't have to ask. What's the famous guy who jumped out of the airplane? Um, they still haven't found. They, never, they haven't found his identity. DB something. Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, what's this? Uh, DB, uh, DB Cooper. DB Cooper. Yes, DB Cooper. So he 
uh, basically hijacked an airplane, got the money, and then jumped out with a parachute and was apparently never found. And oh, now there's people yes, that have I've heard of report that. they've been searching for him. I watched the whole documentary on it, like searching for him and they think they found him and it's it's wild. So he this LW so Wright this is, is the it, NASCAR this is the NASCAR yes. version of that guy. And he's that guy. This, so then do we even really know for sure that he's dead? That is a good point. It's not I really be known. respectful. It does sound like he yeah. passed away and uh rest in peace. Can R. we R. talk about the horsepower convict. for a second? Oh, our favorite topic? Why don't you lead the way on this one? <laughs> well, just because um, David Wilson was recently quoted saying they'd like to see better racing at short tracks. David, that's David Wilson from Toyota um, TRD, and they're open to anything. And the if the if there's consensus that they need to put the power back up, then Toyota is on board, which Woo! just shows to you that um, <laughs> that that is a, that pretty much to me is a public quote of opening up. Um, or overcoming the BS excuse that we've gotten for years that it's the manufacturers that want to cut horsepower. Uh, so, Well, let's just think about this for a second. So we've had now confirmation from the engine builders in, I believe possible. it was Doug Yates, that said it's possible and it wouldn't cost too much. We've now had an OEM be the first to jump through and say, hey, we'll support more horsepower. Mm-hmm. So what, we, what else not? do we need? I mean, if, and they Why all not? talk. So unless this was Toyota trying to, you know, move it forward, or they felt like the backlash was that they were the rumor was they were the ones holding it back, which I we now know isn't true. Um, well, not, hey. I, I'm not going to say it, I'm not going to say it was never true. Okay, that's I'm a good just point. saying. Yeah, I, I I just think that there's just this weird triangle of communication of why have we been cutting horsepower for a decade? Why I don't know. It's it's somebody decided. Whether it was NASCAR wanted to cut horsepower because they thought that every race could be a super speedway race, or the engine builders wanting to cut horsepower and blaming it on the OEMs because the engine builders thought that it would they could save money and still obviously the teams didn't get to save any money because they've been paying more money over the years. But <laughs> did the engine builders get to cut some of their expenses by cutting horsepower and blaming it on the OEMs? Did the OEMs want to cut horsepower because they don't manufacture any cars with that much horsepower? So they thought, what's, what's, you know, why are we doing that? I don't know. Somebody has been getting bamboozled for a decade on cutting horsepower. And at the end of the day, it's the fans and the drivers that have, that have paid the price because the racing has not been what, I think what we hope it's not not that racing is bad, but I'm just saying. Um, the, well, it's been the subpar drivers. at the short tracks. Let's be honest. Yeah, you know, it's, part, at least at the short tracks. Yeah, the short tracks have struggled, and it's just not been the it's not been what we believe stock car racing should look like at short tracks. Um, in terms of tire right. fall off and comers and goers, and you know being able to move grooves around and have the right. drivers have control over their cars, control over yeah, the performance the, of their cars. The finesse um, that's required to make a stock car go fast for a long period of time on a short track, right. it just seems to be missing. Right. So, so uh, once I, it, it wasn't even two, three years ago, I think I even said to Corey LaJoy, we may never see 800 horsepower again. Mm. And that looks to be like a bad, like, like I was wrong because it seems to be going the other direction here and we might get a shot. 2018 fall, Texas qualifying. You were in that. We were mm -hmm. doing – I did 206 miles per hour into turn one, and I remember all of us were commiserating as we did that qualifying session and thinking it might have been the last high horsepower, low downforce qualifying lap at a mile and a half that any of us would do. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that's not yeah. the case, and I would love I for it that. not to be. So we'll see. We're not going to dive into a horsepower discussion. Anyone who's listened to this podcast has heard us ad nauseum talk about it. <laughs> all we can say is – it's great to see OEM support out there in getting more horsepower. Let's dive into Formula One um, and breaking news here. I just want you to be sitting. I know you're sitting, but if you're listening, <laughs> please be sitting. Liberty Media, which owns Formula One, at least the rights, the uh, FOM, they are rich. <laughs> that That's the news. Um, so they basically have topped Forbes' top 25 list for most valuable sports empires or entities. Um, and somewhere around $18.2 which I genuinely would think that F1 has to be 90% of that. 
Um, nonetheless, good for them. Good for F1. You guys are rich. We're happy for you. <laughs> yep. Good job. Congrats. <laughs> Congrats. Uh, Andretti, who have been continually fighting for their bid to enter F1, has been working in the background, although their bid has not been accepted. And this continues to go on. And I was recently at a GM event that they were talking about their support of this and hoping that this continues. And they're all investing under the, you know, thought process that it will happen. But it is still unknown if this will ha- if this comes to that they get to enter Formula One as a new team. Uh, but working right now, they did their 2025 uh, debut as a wind tunnel model that they review revealed, hmm. um, and it looks very much similar to other f1 cars <laughs> but uh i thought it was pretty interesting that they are continuing to develop and work and they do not have an entry yet so this is this it, is serious you know investment what, you know it blows me away about this process is how much money andretti has got to be spending on this f1 team that doesn't exist I yet yeah. i mean i'm rooting for him i hope to see it but wow Mm-hmm. It's 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 crazy what has to be done or what's being done. Here's what I think is interesting. You could say they're spending all this money and it would be a you know basically a write off at the end if they don't get an F one entry. But you have to think right off. All, what, well, right, my what, point. What are you talking? My, about? Not a write off. Like, not a write off. My point. There's real dollars that are being no, spent saying, right now. You know, well, not like write off. Like, I meant like it's worth nothing. Like it was all for zero. Oh, nothing. I get what you're saying. I'm like right so. <laughs> Yeah, like like write it off like that 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 well shit we just totally wasted our time and money. No, what I'm saying right. is you then have to think okay they're investing all this in engineering and development and all this. Well, they still have race teams in a variety of racing series, so that technology is going to be there available to them, right? So if this mm-hmm. doesn't happen, whether you know they have a sports car program now with Wayne Taylor Racing, I think there is you know, you can look at it as like. They're spending all this money to do this, and maybe it's for nothing. But there is still a ginormous race team that can benefit from those those investments that, you know, maybe they wouldn't have made without this F one opportunity. And I don't know how much I, it could be it's used, a, but it's interesting. It's a good point. It's yep. a good point, but I think it's a stretch to try to uh, like just say that. Oh, well, you know, it's still money well spent. No, there's they have like a hundred and there's 120 people that are working on this F one project already. My goodness, on behalf of Andretti. <laughs> between GM in Charlotte and and the seventy people they have working in the UK to develop this car or develop whatever, not to mention imagine the legal expenses and the administration expenses that they've done just trying to get the uh, to get their entry. So you know you have the car development that's happening for a car that doesn't exist. You have the legal work <laughs> to try to earn this team. Um, yep. I'm guessing that this is tens of millions of dollars being spent annually to get to where they're at now and to keep going it's very it's just impressive it's un it's it's mind-boggling <laughs> to me it, but hey if that's what yeah. you have to do maybe that's what you have to do it shows how serious they are you know this isn't just some hey fly by night let's give us an f1 team we'll put it all together it's like nope we're doing it we're here we're ready mm-hmm. to go racing that would be the ultimate flex though to turn around in about I don't know, six, eight months and have a full fledged car they could go test with <laughs> and be ready to race that fits the rules and be like, hey, F1, ball's in your court. We're here. We've already built the damn <laughs> yeah. thing. That's actually yeah, kind of, exactly. that's pretty awesome. Go, Michael. Exactly. I saw Michael this weekend, <laughs> gave him a dap, dapped him up a little bit, you know, pound. It's just pound. Said, hey, you're doing a good job. He's like, thanks. I don't that's know awesome. who you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, let's talk. Hey, so there's a new yeah. F2. Well, we can talk about this quick because I know we want to get to. I want to talk about the F1 contracts that have been re-signed. But so there's a new F2 car. That's I was pretty impressed by some of the stats of this thing. This is a, this is a fast race car. Like, Hell I didn't yeah. realize, have they always? Uh, it's got 620 horsepower. Um, it's only 1700 pounds. Uh, DRS. But have they always had DRS on those things, or is I that a so. new? I haven't edition. watched a lot of F2, I won't lie. I haven't, it's, uh, well, I've I, it's that kind way. of hard for us to watch in, in the States, I think. It is but, tough, uh, and uh, I think the, the, the thing that's always been interesting to me about F2 is that you do have some pretty dominant teams, even though it's a spec series. 
um, mm-hmm. and it would kind of it was pretty evident many years ago as well. I mean, I watched a bit of GP2 growing up. I wanted to go there badly, and then as it morphed into F2, I've paid attention at times, especially when Logan Sargent was there as an American. You're I've just looked not at rich it. enough. Yeah, we're just not rich enough. Um, <laughs> here's the thing about this. I thought this was interesting and in why it's in our rundown. So, yeah, you point out some of the cool aspects. One 620 horsepower, 3.4 liter turbo charged V6 from Mechachrome. Mechachrome, you might remember as a engine uh, builder that has shown up in F1 many, many, many years ago um, with engines that basically lit on fire all the time. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> they've been in sports cars before, I believe. I'm trying now. I'm really testing my knowledge, but I saw that name and I thought it was interesting. But yeah, to your point, 620 horsepower, 0 16, 2.9 seconds. It's got DRS. It has its ginormous wing on the back, mm-hmm. yeah, big ass wing, you know, as Dale Jr. would say. And mm-hmm. I just think it's a proper race car. Like this is a full on, just below IndyCar car race car, and it's F2. It's like that is very, very cool that they, you know, their feeder series car is that is this good Mm -hmm. but it does in a lot of ways you know it is a simplified open wheel car it's got a lot of downforce it's got an engine that makes a lot of power and it goes really fast Mm -hmm. it's kind of what you want out of top level racing (laughs) that's where i wanted to go with this because (laughs) it's kind of like okay make that a thousand horsepower and you have an f1 car that we all want like it's just a a turbocharged v6 making a thousand horsepower sign us up all day long, right? Get rid of the hybrid shit. Let's just go racing. Yeah, I mean, I would. We talked about this last, I think, last week, where I just said, "Man, you know, the F one car is cool." Oh, it was, it was when we talked about the the F one unveil, unveil, and yep. it was just like ah, too much body work for me, right? My mm-hmm. dream of an F one car is is, you know, give me what we had in the eighties and nineties, where it's four tires, two side pods, and two wings, and and a thousand horsepower, right? And so, and That's actually, I think is. there was a. There was a viral Instagram. Um, I can't remember if it was from our buddies at Caraway or which where it was, but um, I know you and I were sending it back and forth with each other. But it was an Instagram of some 80s and 90s F1 memories and highlights and pictures and stuff. And just the cars were so simple. Yeah, there's so much technology. I'm not trying to say that you know F1 loses its identity of just amazing technology and money being spent, but like I just there's something amazing about that sheer amount of technology and money going into a car that can look that simple and mm-hmm. then be that fast right yep. and so when it just when you get all the rest of the body work and stuff like that it starts looking like a car like a stock car um or i mean we i love the prototypes those are special they have tons of body work but they're, they're a different category for me an f1 car should be just four big tires and big horsepower and um and that's it Mm-hmm. I think this, from the side profile, is a tremendous looking race car. Um, it looks great. I love the exhaust out the center, below the airbox in the back. It's just it's it's a great looking race car. So well done to them uh, on this F two car. It's kind of like in NASCAR, the Xfinity the tires car. are a little too profile low profile though. Yeah, that's been that trend they've went to you know the last couple of years, and it's I wish they would go back on that. But the I like meteor tires. Yeah, some meat on my tires, meat on the bone. <laughs> give me, give me some thirteen-inch wheels, man. That's what I want on these things. How about the fly, last point? How about the fly-by-wire yep. throttle? Is that a are F one cars like that? I would imagine. Mm, I'd imagine, I guess, throttle. I mean, I know so GTP cars uh, have fly-by-wire braking for the rear. That's all through the electronics, which is oh, wild. That's right. Yeah. And it's very hard to mix into the you know the physical braking that comes in the front of the car. Um, fly Wait, by so wire throttle, though. I think that's wire, been around. The, so the rear on G, on the GTPs are fly by wire, and the front is mechanical. Yes, correct. Or hydraulic. Yeah, correct. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, those cars were very odd. Uh, you know, that's what they fought all last year at the beginning of the year in mm-hmm. terms of matching that up and just how complex that is. And then still, I was talking to Ben Keating, who did the LMP2 and the GTP, and he said the mm-hmm. funny thing about the GTP car is it's so – it's not intuitive. He's like, you know, you think, hey, I'm locking the rears. Use less brake. He's like, no, you actually want to brake harder because if you use less brake, it sends more brake to the rear 
which then causes you to lock the rears more. And he's like, it's it's confusing, but that's how they built the systems within the car and so on and so forth. And so it, it mm-hmm. yes, it, it forces you to be, you know, to think that counterintuitively to what you know. Um, fly by wire on the throttle, I believe that's pretty consistent um, mm-hmm. out there for a lot of things. I know, you know, like the Tesla Cybertruck has uh, actually non-mechanical steering as well and such. That's all, you know, just assisted by motors, and it has a bunch of fail safes and that sort of thing. And I guess this has existed for a while. So, wow, racing proves more technology. You wanted to talk about it. I'm letting you have your time now. Charles Leclerc, Lando Norris, they both re-signed <laughs> for multi-year deals at their current teams. What do you want to dive into here? What was there a shock um, in here at all? Well, I just oh, first of all, we're lo- I'm looking at a really nice little graphic. Uh, I don't know if we're gonna, we can share that or if we should tweet it out or something like that. That just kind of gives you a visual of the timeline. So I think that Lando and Charles are signed through 2028. Yep. Um, which I think that Lando, you know, we're I think we're seeing some peak Lando Norris, or he's he's on his way up, right? Like I don't want to say peak. That's probably not the right. That's not what I'm trying to say. And to, he ran so well this year that there was these there was rumors or maybe people were just throwing it out there that he should be a candidate for Red Bull seat or um you know or that he's going to get his shot here and for McLaren to lock him down I think shows is pretty interesting to me cuz McLaren is on its way up Lando's on its way on his way up at the same time uh, is the next in over the course of the next three or four years as rules change or things change and um, trends change? Are we going to see a McLaren era in 26, 27, 28? Is, and is it going to be, are we going to see a Lando Norris world champion? Like, Oh, I, I, <laughs> I, I just feel I, like that. Yeah. I just, I just sense that the, like this, this, there's some, this is brewing. Like this is the, origination of that mm. see i would go more down the path of charles leclerc being a champion that ferrari figures this out finally and mm-hmm. i do believe you know a lot of people found it interesting he resigned there considering he's done incredible work in qualifying and you know outpaced the speed of that car often mm-hmm. you know was i don't think there was a better opportunity for him but he also made it very clear that his dream is to win an f1 championship with ferrari so I think that is uh, that's a powerful motivator that you know that team has the resources, almost endless resources to eventually, with the right people, figure it out right. and become that top contender once again uh, to go and beat Red Bull. McLaren. I think is in they, a good they're gonna position. have to scrap for it. Yeah, they're, they're, they're gonna have they're to gonna, scrap yeah. for it. They're gonna need they're gonna need something positive. They're gonna need the blown diffuser, Braun GP style, two thousand nine. I mean, maybe not that ex- you know that excessive of having they an don't advantage, need that much. but. Yeah, but I mean, my point being, they're going to need something, a catalyst, right, that drives them forward in that sense. Um, but I, I believe of the teams that aren't a, you know, owned by a manufacturer, essentially, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I mean, Red Bull, I guess, is that, but they're kind of their own thing. I, I think they so, have that opportunity. I, I, here's my he, one other thing I thought was interesting yeah. with Lando Norris, just real quick. He... He had a really interesting quote about you know people being like, hey, should he go to Red Bull and that sort of thing and go up against Max? Is he scared of Max? And he said, no. He said, you know, first and foremost, of course, he's the best driver in the world right now. There's no doubting that, which I thought was really uh, impressive that he would say something like that. But then secondly, he said, what do you, you know, what do you expect for a guy like myself or Charles or even Lewis Hamilton to, you know, do? What, who would we be if we thought we could just waltz into a team that someone's been there for ten years? And suddenly become the top dog against the top dog. It was like mm-hmm. he's like, what? What? How does that make any sense? So I thought that was really interesting. You know, of a take I, of, of why not just stay where you are and where you're comfortable. Can I share my own experience with this? And I know you've asked Go. this question. You've been asked this question a million times, and I don't know how you've answered it. But like, I would get this question all the time when I was testing for Hendrick or being a part. You know, in that sort of circle and. and and then racing in the cup series at the same time. And people would ask me sponsors or, you know, whatever and I'd be at a Q and a or something. And they'd be like, you drive Jimmy Johnson's car all the time. Are you faster than him? Did you, <laughs> if you were driving Jimmy's the 48, could you win all the same races that he won? And like, 
the answer is so much more complex than that, right? Like, I don't know if, you know, of course I would want to replace Jimmy Johnson in the 48 car, right? If I had the opportunity, if he retired or if I, you know, whatever it was. But it, but at the same time, it was also like, I don't know. I'd rather them start my own team for me with my crew chief. Like to just inherit the number 48 Lowe's Chevrolet with Chad Knauss at the helm. <laughs> like, how could you ever take that spot? <laughs> It, it's that's that's why I mean that's why they change numbers and change branding and change things when they when there's a monumental change like that because you it's too much it it's just a it's a total shift in energy mm-hmm. um, for those situations and racing is so much more complex than just like okay that car that driver and then plug take that driver out and put another driver and there's a whole team chemistry to it all so yeah um, one last note on the driver contracts and then we'll move on whoever it is. Whether it's Charles Leclerc or Lando Norris or, you know, maybe Mercedes can can find something here in the next couple of years. I not to say that Max is a becoming a villain. I don't think it's that. But whoever can dethrone Max Verstappen and Red Bull is going to be an international hero, <laughs> and it will be it will be inter- it will be it will be That's fun to watch. Point. It'll be interesting. That is epic. Can you imagine? Can you yeah. imagine if Ferrari be... and Charles Leclerc dethrone Max Verstappen in the next few years? It would with <laughs> that might be the that might be the the resurgent energy that F one needs to recapture the F one American tourists that mm-hmm. got interested in F one through Drive to Survive. They were fans for one or two years, and they realized the same guy wins every week. It might bring them back. Josh is messaging us. I have far too much faith in Ferrari engineers. Stop it, Josh. I'm trying to make drama. I'm trying to get. <laughs> I'm trying to get people interested in the race, in, in racing. I'm trying to I'm give us a storyline to follow. I'm trying I'm to give us a storyline to follow. Yeah, Just, I, I, I think, I think a great if point. The, the timing is right. I think for whoever's writing the F1 script, if I don't know if the NFL and F1 work together on writing their scripts for the season, <laughs> but whoever's writing the F1 script <laughs> needs to give Ferrari. A, f- a little more horsepower. Actually, you know what? It's not horsepower. They need to what whatever they do to their strategy. I mean, yeah, they just need to stretch. You know what? The best strategy for them break down. Yeah, and the best strategy for them would be to just do nothing. Like if they just did nothing yeah. and just like yeah. just take take a strategy like, like the leader pick. here. Yep, <laughs> do whatever the leader does. <laughs> Pitting with the leaders, dude. The leaders. <laughs> that's the best. Uh, <laughs> for those who don't know, that's basically the the cop out in that we don't know what we're doing or we don't yeah, we have yeah. no plan. Never, Just pit whatever the leader does. Yeah, pit with the leader. <laughs> I think you're 100. Right. I love it. I love as a driver. Now we're going off a tangent. Now I, I yeah. love as a driver when it's just like you get spotter and crew chief. They clearly don't know what they want to happen, and yep. it's just like you know what? I'm just gonna make this decision. <laughs> Well, well count, it's, they're trying to count lead lap cars and all this stuff. And it's just like that. Okay. It's going to be like a mile and a half on a lead, long green flag run, or it's the super speedways that always make me laugh. And it's like, we're not sure when everyone's pitting. It's just like, it's three in front of you, pit, pit. It's like, okay, <laughs> what a cop out. <laughs> Got it. We're just all going to read each other's minds. Um, <laughs> oh, my gosh. You are right. If whoever that is that takes down Max with all this attention, mm-hmm. they'll be, it'll be the biggest moment in – they'll. They could win seven more championships after that and get eight, and it still won't be as big as the first. So, yep, yep. Good luck, whoever that is. We are rooting. Well, we're not, but FOM is definitely rooting for you. <laughs> so, Liberty Media, they'd like to stay rich. Uh, Formula <laughs> One registered for trademarks uh, surrounding a Chicago Grand Prix. They registered the Formula One Grand Prix of Chicago, Chicago Grand Prix, Formula One Chicago Grand Prix, and Grand Prix of Chicago. Um, Hey, F1, you better do that with NASCAR. That's all I'm saying. That's interesting. As mm-hmm. much trouble as NASCAR's had, or as hard as Na- – uh, let me say this the right way. As hard as NASCAR has had to fight for this race in Chicago, yep. it makes you wonder how F1 could even do it without doing it in conjunction with NASCAR. That'd be big. Does – Right, like, how could they possibly? How could NASCAR possibly have their own standalone event, and and then have a different NASCAR uh, Formula One event? So it, it's yep. 
So I think you have a Oops, call sorry. coming in, I, by the way. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then I ended up marking this clip. What, anyways, what I'm saying is, it it maybe it's one or the other. Yeah, I think uh, uh, it it may have to be one or the other. Which I don't. Maybe that would be net bad for NASCAR. But I did see a quote from some people within Chicago that said it was rumored that F1 basically started with saying, "Hey, this has to be a 10 year contract like we have in Las Vegas," and that was a non-starter mm-hmm. for the city. NASCAR, on the other hand, wow. is very flexible. I basically I know they've been on a three year deal, but it essentially has breaks, you know, each year, uh, mm-hmm. from what I understand, and therefore is a lot more flexible. Um, and I think the city, knowing a city like Chicago and your political undertones and how quick how you know politics change over the course of ten years, even two or three years, <clears throat> no one's going to commit to ten years. I don't see that happening. Speaking of new F one races, uh, Madrid is uh, reported to be paying roughly double what Barcelona was paying. And this continues the trend of the street course, city, street-based things paying gargantuan rights fees compared to uh, classic tracks. Although Barcelona is one that's near and dear to my heart and sort of nostalgic from being a place that they go testing and that sort of thing, I won't say it, but ever put on the best races. So hmm. it's probably not a big loss. Um, global motorsport stuff out there. <laughs> Mazda MX-5 Cup tweeted at me and said they'd like me back in an mx5 cup car we should do it together landon that's we'll do a money lap event where do we need it to too do much it? fun Can, I, 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 is walk it walkins glenn sounds like it'd be fun in mx5 that, cups that's gonna be a lot of drafting don't you know like road america was a draft it was talladega basically our they, daytona they basically all I, are yeah daytona sounds awesome i think Daytona's daytona crazy. laguna seca mm. i don't you I like know laguna. what the glenn might go down my list um how about coda yeah, wherever I don't know, I haven't looked at their most recent their schedule this year, but those all sound great. I would definitely do those. I would like to do one that oh. wasn't so drafting, though. I know drafting was a lot of fun, and I think every single one will involve a little drafting. But like Road America, you could come off the corner and you know completely botch the corner as long as you got in the throttle and got in the draft, you were fine. And I think Daytona mm-hmm. is a similar mix of super speedway and road so what, course. Like Sonoma, just, ooh, ooh, freshly paved Sonoma MX Five. I don't know. Car. They don't go there. They don't go there. They don't do go they? There, I don't think no. Yeah. I'd like to do a street course. They have done street courses, which is fun. Okay. That'd be cool. So we'll see. Uh, Mazda, you now ha- you've had me, but I'm even more fun with my buddy Landon and a whole money lap team. Let's make it happen. I'll do it. Let I'll us know. It. We should go sports car racing. We didn't even put that at the top, but Landon Castle, Park Kligman, take on the sports car world. That'd be fun. So I'm good uh, with that too. Big news or big rumor. That's breaking right now. Brody Kostecki, who was on Money Lap Live uh, back in December, the 2023 Supercars champion in Australia, reportedly is going to split from the team that he won the championship with this past year, uh, Erebus, in an absolutely shock move without a guaranteed ride and may have to sit out the 2024 season. A little bit of background on this. Um, The... It sounds like it's centering around some disagreement with team management, of course, which is normally how these things go. But this well, team, Motorsport Erebus, is, is reporting a major disagreement. Yeah. Which yeah. I guess that's what it would take. <laughs> it's what it would take to uh, basically leave. I think this team, Erebus, has had a lot of drama around it before. Um, and the mm-hmm. owner is, I, I've never said her last name right, but I believe it's like Betty and maybe Josh can help me out here. Mm-hmm. Um, Komenko? Komenko? Kim and Co, something like that. She inherited a lot of money from her family founded, I think one of the large grocery chains or something in Australia. Nonetheless, um, for whatever reason, through their history, they've just had a lot of drama like this with drivers and team members and even manufacturer drama. And so they've been mm-hmm. successful. They have the resources, but they seem to have moments like this. Um, so I mm-hmm. hope for Supercar's sake and Brody, who seemed to be a really nice dude, um, when he came on our show, they can figure this out, and he's still racing. He's fun to watch. He took down SVG. I mean, that's unheard of in this day and age. But well, right, we'll see how this – we'll, we'll track to see how it works out. He's already got some NASCAR races scheduled this year, right? I don't know if they were announced as scheduled. It's just basically they said they would run some. Um, and that was sort of and a he's combo no between stranger Erebus stranger and this area. area. Yeah, no. I mean, he's the one that's already lived here. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe this is his exit to, uh, to well, the U.S. full time. Do you remember when we asked him that 
on mm -hmm. Money Lap Live, and he told us he wanted to go continue racing supercars and win more championships. So mm -hmm. he wasn't ready to, to come over here and do NASCAR. So we'll see. I don't know. Um, it was – well, it, this team, for every reason, just had a lot of drama around it, and I hope he's on the grid. Um, we mentioned earlier the Rolex 24 was a massive hit in every single way except for – it wasn't actually 24 hours long. It was 23 <laughs> hours and 58 minutes <laughs> because of a timing and scoring hiccup, mess up, whatever you want to call it, uh, by IMSA at the end of the race that ended the race essentially a lap too early. Um, and therefore, it was not a full 24 hour race for the GTP cars. <laughs> my, my favorite part about this is that you know what? I, I, it's it's it, sure it's drama. I'm not trying to minimize mm -hmm. it. Um, it was it sucked because the, the broadcast didn't get to have like a proper call to the finish and whatever. So it is it's it's legitimate. I'm trying to not trying to minimize. But um, the the funniest thing to me about this is like they've come out with the regulations and all this stuff, and they they the regulations in typical motorsports regulatory fashion read something like. Uh, regulation structure. This is our rule. This is our policy. This is our policy. And then, oh, by the way, uh, it's just over when it's over. <laughs> the last <laughs> sentence says, yeah. the race is nevertheless deemed ended when the flag is displayed. <laughs> we can end so, it. It's like, a 24 hour race like, that we these... can end one minute in. Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah, it's just like all these policies and all this stuff. And here's what you do. And here's what we do with if this scenario. And, da, 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 da. and oh, by the way, if it's over, it's over. <laughs> That's like, I think. We run the okay. next car. <laughs> yeah, Go we ahead. run events though, and we run the and we. You have to do have, that. You have to have a catch all when you realize you really break down a racing event and <laughs> sort of thing. You have to have a catch all that basically just says everything else in this rule book is whatever we you know is moot <laughs> yeah. when we decide this one thing. <laughs> it's like <laughs> when, when you're the one that runs the event, you do you have rules so that you can keep it as organized as possible. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you have to be able to tell the complainers to shut up and leave your office. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm also going to give uh, IMSA credit for owning up to it quickly and putting it out there by saying it was our mistake and here's what happened they didn't try to hide behind something it was just no, this was a good. mistake so I'll give them credit on that and you know what it didn't change the outcome at all it wasn't going to change the outcome and they'll be better in the future uh, there was a bit of drama Friday night before the Rolex 24 in the motorhome lot. Uh, very sad news. Chip Ganassi uh, hit Devlin DeFrancesco's dog, killing the dog, in the uh, bus lot. This was a dramatic thing on Twitter over the, last, over the weekend, but it sounds like the two sides are trying to – Chip has tried to reach out to the DeFrancesco's and – his uh, as of what was this January, yesterday? Jennifer Fire saying that his calls had gone unanswered. So hopefully they solve it. That's too Not, bad. Yeah, sad to see a little puppy deceased. But those bus slots and the the, I mean, racetracks are dark at night. I can see it. So it happens. Yeah, Daytona's accidents happen. Driver owner lot. There's it's it's very inviting. Uh, I've had my dogs there, my kids there. Uh, people have golf carts, so zooming through the motorhomes and things can pop out. It's it's very stimulating environment although yeah. this was pretty late at night that it happened but it's just i don't know it's very sad too bad yeah very sad uh theory newville won the wrc in monte carlo didn't really get to see any of it obviously it was the rolex this weekend that sort of thing but i did get to see those uh amazing that every year highlights on instagram and such of the cars blasting through the snow covered streets and fireworks going off in every direction and fans lining the streets <laughs> and such it's the most incredible imagery and you're just like damn Life goals. yeah that just looks epic um hey what do we do here we're at ah oh, we didn't quite make an hour so i apologize well we're over With an that, hour uh, yeah we did run out of time to bring kyle bush on so we apologize for that once again um we're even over an hour so landon this has been fun that's another money lap Peace. All right, let's do it.
Thanks for listening to the Money Lap. As always, check out themoneylap.com for the best five minutes in motorsports or sometimes just the coolest stuff in motorsports. Delivered directly to your inbox three times a week. Check us out on YouTube. We're growing fast over there. And, of course, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram. We're all over the Internet. We're spreading the word of how cool motorsports is. Check us out.